And thank you so much, Eric. Uh, you uh, did a great job kind of connecting the dots with the lesson that we're looking at today, especially for the kids. I should just say I am amen and step aside. Uh, but uh, I'm going to tell a story about Eric uh, because of something that he did. Uh, it's not bad. It's not bad. Uh, Eric, leading into our, uh, our uh, trunk or treat, he sends mail, United States mail, snail mail to families that have been a part of our preschool and have been a part of our ministry in whatever way, shape, or form. And one of those got forwarded to a new address for this family that is in Texas. And I was just telling Eric this week that that family called their preschool teacher that they had had last year to say that they have never seen a place like Prince of Peace where the love and the care and the sharing continues even after they're thousands of miles away. So thank you very much, Eric. That was just a great story of the way God uses us authentically to connect with people. And as we look today at the God who gives everything to us, today we look at God giving us authenticity. And we're looking at a scripture from the prophet Amos, Amos chapter 5, which is not one that I think we typically preach on. The words are a little strong. Did you catch what those words were? What the prophet was saying? Anytime when a prophet begins or a preacher begins with the word woe, and it's not woe, it's woe. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Wow. What's going on among God's people that the prophet needs to speak so distinctly, so strongly, right out of the gate for us today? Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord oftentimes referred to the day of God's coming, the day when we look for God to come and rescue us, to, to make all things right. And if the prophet is beginning by saying, woe to those of you who long for the day of the Lord, he's saying something not right. We don't often like to think that about our lives. I know that we see parts of our lives that aren't really going well at times. We experience things that are sometimes difficult. Sometimes we've had our own shortcomings and failures to have to deal with. Anytime there are people involved in this world, there's a possibility for tension and breakdown of relationship. All of those things are a part of our reality. But when we come here to church, we don't often begin to think that the message is going to say, woe to you. So what's going on here? The next image that the prophet uses is one that is easy to skip over when we hear it. That day will be as if a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. So the picture here is someone who runs away from a lion. Their life is saved. They're okay. But then they see a bear. And it's like their life is in peril again. Only to run away from the bear as he enters the house and when he says, oh, I, I survived that. He puts his hand on the wall and he's bitten by a poisonous snake. These are dark words from the prophet. Let's back up a little bit and look at the context because it's hard for us to see where these words might fit our lives and our context. The prophet is preaching to the people of Israel, many of whom have forgotten God's ways or have gone simply through the motions of, of their religiosity. Perhaps there's some touch points for our world today. The prophet is preaching to people who have experienced great prosperity. And sometimes they've found that, that the end will justify the means. In other words, it's okay to let some things go. Maybe some shady deals. Maybe some taking advantage of others. If it's going to help you get ahead. Perhaps some touch points with our world today. 
It might not, however, feel like it touches where your life is. But then the prophet goes to speaking about the worship of the people. He says, and the words in my Bible are in quotes, as if God himself is speaking this. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. See David up there. David, try harder. Right? God's saying, I don't like your worship. It's, but it's not a try harder thing. You know, when I think about this, God is saying, your worship is not aligning with what my desires are for you. And it's not about style. It's not about how it takes place. In this case, it's a matter of the heart. And perhaps that's something you and I can relate to. Because our hearts are never completely and fully aligned with what God wants for us. Not while we live in this world. Because you and I, as long as we live in this world, we struggle with sin. And so as the prophet is really, some might say, where I grew up in Indiana, taking a two-by-four and hitting the people alongside the head to get their attention, there's something here for us that God wants to get our attention. He wants us to step back and evaluate our lives, our worship, how we receive him, how we receive others. And a part of this is how we live out our faith. As the prophet goes to the next thing, verse 24, but let justice roll down like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Words made famous and popular in our day and age by Reverend Dark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, I've got to say, before church today, I had this thought that came. It wasn't just a thought, it was something that happened to me. Someone approached me outside the church, and I wasn't thinking about my sermon. I wasn't thinking about justice. I wasn't thinking about helping the needy. I wasn't thinking about the poor and the downtrodden. I was just thinking about things for getting ready for worship. Just the things that you would think of if you were the pastor, or perhaps the things that you might think of as you're getting ready to get here on Sunday morning. And someone approached me. They asked me if I speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. But I knew what he was asking just by his hand motions. He was asking, can I charge my phone? And I thought to myself, no, you can't charge your phone. If I have you charge your, can I just be unfiltered? Is that okay? Okay. You can't charge, I didn't say this, but I thought it. You can't charge your phone. Once I let someone charge their phone, everyone's going to be bringing their phone here. This is why we've closed off the electrical receptacles outside the church because sometimes people are just camping while they charge their phone. We have people arriving for worship. This is what's in my mind. And I thought, after the gentleman walked off, I thought, what, what's your sermon about today, Ken? It's about justice and mercy. It's about how we receive people and how we welcome people. It's about whether we take the risk where something may be uncomfortable for us. I'm not saying that you have to go seek someone out. Usually in your life and mine, something, some opportunity to show God's love will seek us out. Why is that? Because it's by God's design that he places us in this world and that he gives us opportunity to show grace. And so what I'm saying is I re as I reflect, I don't think I was really gracious. Could you imagine if that person were charging his phone and he heard the gospel, how that might change things for them if I had not prejudged him? I don't know if I was very authentic in that moment. I'm not always the representation of authenticity that I should be. 
when it comes to worshiping the Lord. And may I say it this way too, neither are you. None of us are. However, it is a God who is gracious, who has come to us, authentically living up to his name, living up to his glory, living up to his grace, coming to us so that he might bring his grace to those like you and me who don't deserve it, so that he might take the burden of our sins, the things that we fall short on, the opportunities that we squander, the times when we hold on to something, make assumptions about somebody rather than working through the issues and trying to find the common ground in our relationships. Our God draws us in so that he might wrap his arms around us, so that he might teach us what it is to love mercy and to do justice and walk humbly with our God. And when we acknowledge our need, how great it is, if we were to step back and really see that, that would change what our worship is like. Instead of seeing Sunday morning as an hour or two that we dedicate to the Lord, isn't that so good of us to do so, right? Rather, we see that this is the opportunity for us to be gathered in amongst God's people to worship the God who dedicated his son to us who dedicated his love to us, who redeemed all the world. It changes our perspective, as only Jesus can. As he draws us into worship, he reminds us that he is not looking, our God is not looking for a slice of the pie. He came for the whole enchilada, that we would be his in every regard. The fullness of that will not be seen until the day of the Lord. And it is not that you and I are those who should shrink back or fear the day of the Lord. We look forward to its day and hasten its coming because that is when our Lord Jesus Christ will demonstrate the fullness of his power, his mercy, and his love for us as he welcomes us home. And yet in the time that we have now, he calls upon us to look at our lives and to see every opportunity that he places before us, whether that be individually or corporately. Whatever it is that God places in our hearts to do, he will empower us to do it. He will provide the resources, the means. He wants us to seize upon those opportunities not so that we can be proud necessarily of what we do for the Lord, but that we might be glorying in the fact that he uses even us. The God who gives authenticity says with tremendous authenticity that his love is eternal. His peace passes all understanding. His mercy covers every sin. And his power will move us as we serve him and as we serve our neighbor with hearts dedicated to our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.